Dr. Martin Luther King said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Welcome to another podcast that we like to call Wise Counsel. Let's go. Yeah. Thank you all for coming back to this uh, follow-up episode of Wise Counsel. I hope that those of you who are watching us online um, enjoyed that uh, episode from last week. I'm telling you, we had to come back and do this again. Uh, the reviews were raving. Uh, the people seemed to have really enjoyed it. There was great, uh, great interaction here in the studio. We wanted to make sure that we were doing it again. There's something to be said about uh, when real healing is taking place, right? There's something to be said about when people are able to come to the place um, where healing should take place. They should not be hurt in here. There should be healing. Now, now, I, I, we we left you on a cliffhanger, and I did it on purpose. Did it on purpose, right? Um, because I, I I want you all to come back. But before we get to that, I I want to. We didn't even talk about this. Honestly, this just fell on me, like literally just now. I want I want to I want to talk about the notion of the church being the hospital. And if that ain't the problem. Should the church really be a hospital? (laughs) Because the reason you have a hospital is so that you can take in sick folk. Right? But are we drawing people who are sick to keep them sick? Or should this be a teaching ground so that I come in here and learn and then take my life to the next level? Because think about this. I don't know nobody. How many bodies? Nobody. Okay. I don't don't know nobody who, who is able to go to the hospital, they give them medicine, and then at some point or another not become dependent on that medicine. Right. Some have higher tolerances than others. Right. Some come in to get the medicine and now they're hooked. Mm -hmm. And now they're drug addicts for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, When if they had been taught what to do. Y'all follow me? Mm -hmm. If they had been taught what to do, there's a reason why you only have K through 12. Mm -hmm. Because eventually you got to move on. Got to move on. Right. And, and there, there has to be a growth process. And I want to I want to talk about that tonight. But I want to go back to where we were because we were talking about what should a person do when it is that they have found trauma in their church life because it was spawned from their natural life. Here is here is where I believe the issue is. The issue is, is that we have normalized trauma as if it is it is what it's supposed to be. Can I tell you this? If your daddy is slapping your mama, that ain't normal. If your mama is cussing your daddy, it ain't normal. And every household has its dysfunction. I don't care how saved and sanctified you are. Right. I don't care how many tongues you speak in. I don't care how many demons you can cast out. But the truth of the matter is, even for those of you who are watching us online and those of you who are sitting in the room and those of us sitting up on this stage, every one of us has some level of dysfunction. And the truth is, we have not been honest about the dysfunction that we have. Let's let's talk about that. Why can why can't we be honest about our flaws? Somebody talk to me. For, for, for one, when you've been used to an environment and never been exposed to anything else, you believe that to be normal. Mm. So once you've been pulled out that environment and exposed to something new, there's a shell shock effect, effect mm-hmm. that happens where what is this new? And depending on how long you've been in this dysfunctional environment, 
you retract back to what you used to do. Okay, all right, because I, I believe that to be true. That is absolutely true. But how much longer do you operate in your dysfunction when you know it's dysfunctional? Because I have decided. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It comes with a choice. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. this, this is what God said to the children of Israel. He said, I, I set before you life mm -hmm. and death. Mm -hmm. Then he, he gives them an open book test and then turn around and give them the answer. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to set before you life and death, but just choose life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is it so difficult for us to choose life? And it's not because we don't know that life exists for us. Because I am of the persuasion, listen, let me tell y'all this. If I had time, I would go and tell you some of the traumas that I experienced as a kid that didn't have anything to do with me being in the four walls of a church. But it was done by people who went to church. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right? And, but because, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you this. Um, my mama says this all the time. She says, when I look at my sons and I see what the Lord has done in them, she says, God gets all the glory, but your daddy get all the credit. <laughs> there has to be strong men in households. Yes. There has to be strong voices in households, yeah. in churches, yeah. in, in, in the community as a whole, yeah. so that we recognize that I don't have to stay in this foolishness because you got a problem. And then now you're going to make your problem my problem? The devil is a whole lie. The devil is a whole lie. Why, why, why do we have such a problem functioning in that space? Somebody help me. Why do we have such a problem? <laughs> well, I was taught that whatever stays, whatever happens in this Come house on, stays girl. in this house. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was taught that. So I was too. I was taught to be be quiet. And yeah. that's, it's because our parents can only give us what they got. So, you know, they can only give us what they, what they were given. Right. So my grandmother or my grandparents were taught to sweep it under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, we have family members that did what they did, held the title in the church, but don't tell nobody. Yeah. So yeah. I was taught not to be vulnerable, to shut my mouth. Wow. So I went out into the world like that, thinking it was normal, because that, that, that's what was taught to me from a little girl. Anybody else? I would say also that if we don't have that example, kind of picking back on, off of what you said, if we don't have that example, how do I know to be transparent? So I think it's important that we have someone to lead us in that area. If my parents is able to be transparent with me or whoever I'm in my proximity, can show me the way of they're being able to be trans transparent with me. Now I'm learning how to be transparent with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I believe it's God's will that we're able to be transparent and honest and confess certain things because the Bible tells us, he says, confess your fault to one to one another. To another right. So he gives us the answer on how that to be That you may be healed. That you may, right. So that's a part of, you know, he tells us, the, he he's telling us that it is his will that, that we be healed. Yeah. But a part of that is be, being able to be transparent. But Who's teaching me how to be that? Because you just don't know how, you just don't come out that way. It has to be taught. I agree with that. I agree with that. Talk to us. And transparency causes people to look at you different. It takes from your anointing. You're not who you is because of look, what you did or what happened to you. You ain't all that, cat. No, you ain't all that because all this happened to you. And they don't realize People don't really honestly realize this. When you have the opportunity to go through pure hell mm -hmm. and come out on the other side with your hands up like this, come on. That's the victor of it. Right. But people don't understand it as that. Yeah. Wow. That's good. When I realized, you know, when we talk about, you know, the fruits of the spirit, when it's talking about, you know, when it was talking about patience, when it's talking about being humble. Seeing humble, sometimes people think humble being weak. Right. Humble is strength. Right. Right. If I can stand up against your abuse, I'm strong. Right. Your mind manipulation, I'm strong. Right. But some people figure, no, nah, uh, that's a weakness, wow. and that's their mentality of thinking it that way. They need some of that counseling you was talking about. Right. Because that's that's, that's 
No, that, that's a real thing. That's, that's a real, and, and that's why I said what I said, right? That, that for some of us, we need, we need the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. we need counseling, mm -hmm. and we need medicine, mm -hmm. right? Because the truth of the matter is, is that we have neglected the fact that we are just as human as we are divine. Yes. Right? Yes. And you cannot neglect your humanity for your divinity. Cannot. Right? Um, as a matter of fact, um, being up here on this stage under these lights tends to illuminate my, my humanity and not so much my divinity. Okay. Now you get to see my flaws. There you go. You get to see when I'm having a good day and a bad day. Yes. Right? My, the people know when I don't feel like preaching. You heard them? They know it, right? And so I have to now manage myself. Watch this. Not for the health of the people, but for the health of myself. Because I can't give you what I'm not. That's it. And this is where we struggle. Because we're trying to perpetrate a fraud. Yeah. We're trying to give people... My name is not Thomas Dexter Jakes. I'm not getting up here saying, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> as much as I love him, yeah. I am not Bishop Jakes. Nah. I'm Gary Salter. That's it. And I'm going to tell you what Gary Salter says based on the anointing that's on my life. That's it. And, and that's not just important for us up here, but it's just as important for you all out there. Out there. Because you'll only be in public what you really are in private. Yep. And so you have, to be, you have to be comfortable with yourself. And I think this is where the problem is because now we've got sick people trying to make sick people well. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. We have, we have styled, and if that's, if that's your get down, I ain't mad at you. But here's what I'm saying. I will never tell my church, this is the hospital. I'm not telling them that. Because I'm not looking for sick people. What I'm looking for is people who need to be taught. Because if I can build your intelligence, intelligence will tell you, if my pressure is high, I don't need to eat no pork. And then you don't need a doctor. Mm -hmm. Y'all ain't talking to me. Here. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying. That, that's that's just how I that's how I interpret information. Like people have to be able to see things, and I I, I say this to people all the time. Um, they they'll come and ask me a question, and we'll be talking about something, and I'll ask them, now how logical is that? <laughs> Let's not talk about salvation. Let's not talk about what, what the Lord said to you. Let's not talk about what you felt in your spirit. I'm going to ask you, is that logical? Logical. Because if it's not logical, now we got to start asking the questions. Now, I'm not talking about God said something to you. You know God said it to you. That's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. But I'm talking about those nights when you ate some ice cream right before you went to bed. Woo! Y'all ain't going to talk to me either. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, you've had this dream. That's it. That far. The angels came and talked to you in your, in your sleep, right? <laughs> and, now, and now you, you kind of have this whole thing about what you're supposed to do, and it's not logical at all. It doesn't make sense anywhere. Like, you can't attach faith to it. Because I tell people this all the time. There's a thin line between faith and foolishness. Thin line. That's That's good. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. Talk, talk to me. Talk to me, sir. You said the Holy Spirit just dropped about the hospital. Yeah. A month ago, I went back working in the hospital. And two weeks ago, me and the Holy Spirit had a conversation mm -hmm. about the church being the hospital. Yeah. And I sat here and said, I said, and Holy Spirit, I started talking, there's, there's two problems. You have patients that come in. In order for them to get the care they need, they got to be stripped naked for right. certain things. Right. The other part of it is you have healthcare workers who are properly trained, but in church, they don't get that training. So they're practicing on people's realities, wondering why they're still sick. So we have a multiplicity of problems going on. I'm like, if the church and also in the healthcare, 
the longer they keep you, the more money they make. Exactly. So therefore, if preachers exactly. in their trauma is not helping people get healed, they have nobody else to minister to. So I give you just enough to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you will never leave to go be who you need to be because I have a complex of I need you here more than you are needed out there. Exactly. Y'all need to clap it up right there. That's, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. There has to be a sense of intelligence as you go after certain things. And if I am in a ministry where people are dogging me, and they, and you, because here's the thing, like if, if you walk in the room and everybody's talking and then it's like this. <laughs> I mean, you don't even need the Holy Ghost for that. Like, like come on. Let's, let's, the street rules. Yeah, the street rules. Like, you don't, you don't even need the Holy Ghost for this. There's some things that are common sense. And I know, listen to me, y'all, because I said this in the last episode. I want to say this to you all again. I know sometimes that our traumas, in, they, uh, they impact our behaviors. But you've got to get to a place where you say, like Paul said, I'm forgetting those things which are behind me. And I'm reaching forward to those things which are before me. Because if I allow my past to engage my future, I'll miss what and who God has for me right. trying to hold on to yesterday. Right. Y'all see this? Right. And we got to be able to overcome those pains. What you saying there and with the subject we're talking about church hurt, one thing I had to learn to get healed from my church hurt was accountability. Mm-hmm. I said the biggest way to slap the devil in the face is no matter what information you give me, I made the choice. Come on. I don't care how much you manipulate me, give me bad information, I made the choice. Right. When I can acknowledge that I made the choice, I take my power back and I get my voice back. Yeah. So therefore now, no matter what, I would manipulate because I didn't study, I didn't research, I right. didn't do my part. Right. So therefore, no matter what happens, it's my cause. Yeah. Because we're easy to displace the blame on other people and also not realizing, like, what part did I play in this? Right. Because right. nobody can hurt me. You can't come up here and slap me and expect me to sit here. Listen. That's it. So, therefore, if I let you keep doing it, then I'm not doing something to counteract the attack. That's right. So, what part did I play? I allowed myself to lose my identity. That's right. I allowed myself to be intimidated. Yes. I allowed myself to forget the things I know to do. So, therefore, it really was another person. It was all me. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, once I take that accountability... Now I find strength. You know what, God? Forgive me, your Lord. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now I can heal because now I know I was the problem. That's yeah. Right. The other person got to deal with their own issues, but I'm the problem because of what I played in my own party. Yeah. And yeah. I think many people will use the church hurt card because it's easier to say somebody did something. It's easier to make an excuse than to ask God for a solution. Right. Uh, and when we ask God for the solution, we're going to find ourselves, it was me. You know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you all this quick story. I was telling you all about the church that my wife and I were in these for. And uh, when the Lord finally gave us the release to leave that church, um, I went and sat down and I talked with the pastor. I didn't send him a text message. I didn't, I didn't call him on the phone. I didn't write him a letter. I went to his house. I sat down and talked to him face to face. And I said to him, I said, listen, I respect you as a man of God, but this is what the Lord has said to me that it is time for me and my family to go forward. Looks me in my face and says to me, the Lord ain't told you nothing. The Lord ain't told you nothing. I don't care what you say, the Lord didn't tell you nothing. Here's the thing. Had I allowed his trauma and his dysfunction to inform my behavior, we wouldn't even be sitting here. You see what I'm saying? The world would have never gotten a chance to hear if I was if I had anything to say or not. Had I allowed someone who was already broken to now attempt to break me. And because I'm telling y'all, because of the environment that I was nurtured in, it helped me to be able to hear you, respect you and move forward. And that is the type of environment that we have to be able to engage 
even in, in, in the sacred space. Because this church ain't for everybody. It ain't, let me tell you this. I, I said this to the panel before we got started on, on this episode. I said, I dance, I shout, I speak in tongues. Y'all hear me? We cast out demons. This ain't for everybody. But at, at the same token, on the same stage that we do that on, I can sit and have an intelligent conversation. Right? Because it's, a, it's, it's not about how it's communicated. It's the fact that it is communicated. And so we have to be able to create spaces for there to be intelligent conversation and not make people believe that they're coming in here to get high. That they're not coming in here to get their weekly dose. I tell our people all the time, you can dance and shout all you want to, but if you don't have a lifestyle that supports that, it's calisthenics. Yeah. It's calisthenics if you don't have anything to support that kind of behavior. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that functions at your desk on Wednesday morning the same way it did on pew three, seat five on Sunday morning. It's got to be that way. And it would help to uh, minimize the damage that people have. Because the truth of the matter is, Gary is going to say some things that you don't like. Mm -hmm. Gary is a human. Right. So there may be a time somewhere down the line you say, Gary, got one more time to try me. <laughs> you got one more time, brother. Right. Because I am a human. I'm not going to intentionally damage you, but I have the potential to because I'm in the flesh, just like you're in the flesh. And we have to be able to engage those moments like that. And and so for 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 me, I'm thinking why don't we look at our churches more like training centers? Is, is, it, is it possible that the reason that we don't look at them as training centers is because we don't have nothing to train them on? Bishop, you just said a mouth. Oh, okay. Minutes ago, we don't want to train them. We don't want to train them. Because we want to keep them what? Keep them bound. Keep them bound. Because? Because is, is, it, is it possible that their bondage is my freedom? Yes, it is. Bishop, you got to say it again for the tape. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to say it again. You have to say it, it again. Is, is it possible that your bondage is my freedom? Can, can I tell you this? The people that come here and, and the people that come to church here and people who have, who have encountered me, and I am not in any way, shape, or form trying to put a feather in my cap. But I will tell you this, the people that come here know that I love them. They know that I genuinely love them. And I want to see what's best for you, right? And I wish to heaven that there were, there were more of us that had a heart for people to say, hey, I, I like the fact that you belong to this church, but you don't belong to me. That's right. You don't belong to, you're not my member. <laughs> you may come to my church, but guess what? I go to your church. That's it. That's it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? There, there's a difference in the mentality when we change the language around how we engage a moment. Y'all talk to me. Why, why, I, I, why? Why don't we do this? Power. I had a woman apostle um, that um, when I got to this church, it woke up the prophetic and I will never take away from any leader. I learned about the prophetic, and mm -hmm. it opened up my eyes. But she will only, when she saw you elevating this particular leader, it, she had to bring you down mm -hmm. so she can stay up, so you won't go I above her. So wow. if I had a dream, I tell her the dream. She would tell the congregation, and it came from her. She had the dream. Wow. If I... Um, I was sort of like a watchman. If I was given a warning and she didn't agree with it, I was a witch. Wow. And then when it happened, silence. So I think it's power. It is. It is. Can I, can I piggyback off of that? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, man of God. Go for it. Just to piggyback off of that, I think that goes back to um, insecurities as well. I think that goes back to what I mentioned, men, were, were mentioning to you the other day is that I believe that when leaders don't deal with their insecurities, 
then that's when they begin to, you know, manipulate, control, or allow these other unclean spirits to come into their lives, and it causes more problems. So I think it's very important that we deal with our issues that we have. Whatever, whatever, the, whatever you know, position that you hold, we have to deal with stuff. Yeah. And that brings me back to that. It brings me to that scripture in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to those who are blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And so the, the, the verse, the, the portion there, the clause that gets me is that he says he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And so it's important that we allow God, we allow ourselves to give God the opportunity to bring that healing and that deliverance and that breakthrough in our lives. Because if we don't, we can learn all we can, but if we don't give God that opportunity to do what he needs to do, we'll never be made whole. Ooh, you know what, you. Pastor, I mean, young lady, you said a few minutes ago about control. And that's what it is. And that is a spirit. That's a demon. That's a demon. And it operates daily in our church bodies to control people and God go, now hear me well God gonna deal with them now so I think sometimes people think since God hadn't bothered me with me yet it's been five years ten years fifty he ain't done nothing to me yet but you don't know the time I like to say this you don't know the day another hour when your grace gonna run out come on you on empty come on and now God gonna deal with you come on let me ask this question. I, I want to I go back to what he said. Yeah, y'all can clap it up right there. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Can we do that? We'll go back to the scripture. He said, he quoted Luke chapter 4, verse 18, that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, up and on me. But you can also go back over to Isaiah where the Bible says that we ought to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If, if I can put it on, <laughs> if, if, if the spirit of the Lord is up and on me, is it possible that where I function is where the spirit of the Lord is not upon me? And I think the, the problem that we have is that we function in a space where he's not on us because we have purposefully taken him off. Because anything you put on, you can take it off. And to add to that, not only taking God on, taking him off, allow the gift, the anointing to be drunken by it. Yeah. And there should be a headship. If you're telling me I need a leader, where's your leader at? Yeah. Wow. So therefore, you operate in the gift, but who is managing you yeah. as you manage others? And some don't want to say, well, I have this person, but they we don't ever see this person the way you are seen in our lives. Right. So therefore, when the gift begins so great and the people influence and you have all these people who are seeing you at a certain thing, they see the gift. Now pride, just like Nebuchadnezzar, you have to be taken down. Yeah. And even now I believe that while we're doing this, those are here, their timing is coming down now. Yeah. Because many times is people get so infatuated by that gift mm -hmm. where it puffs up pride. Mm -hmm. And if you preach any of my time, we've all faced it at one time or another. Absolutely. So therefore it's, wait a minute, let me humble myself before God humbles let me. Let me do it. Yeah. And because they won't humble and have nobody in their ear say, hey, you're doing God's people the wrong kind of way. Yeah. Now there's a gloating, there's pride, there's false humility. So therefore, now the people all they see is a gift. They don't see the true repentance because you never, you never been wrong. You never admit been wrong. You never this. You always right. Wait a minute, you are taking the place of God. Right. Exactly. Pastor, you know we we get it really twisted. These people ain't none of Gary's people. These God's God people. Right. I just allowed them to be under you for you to do what? Manage them. Manage sure. them. Yes. And then when the day come, I want you to do what? Present them what? Back, Back to, to me. me. Yes. If we don't learn that because some people get it real, real, real twisted that these are my people. Yeah, no, I'm, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm I use not. the term now and I do it even more. God's children. 
Yeah. yeah. As long as I keep, hey, God's children, hey, God's child, I'm always in a place. That's God's child. Yeah. And if it's anything like me, you know my daughter, that's my daughter. You fool with her, you're going to feel my there wrath. There you go. And as long as we respect, no, whether it's from leader to sheep or sheep among sheep, because in Ezekiel, it talks about the sheep amongst the sheep, because uh -huh. all her and from pastor to sheep. It's from sheep among sheep having their own issues and dysfunction right. that they want to try to fix themselves because they want to be little demigods and little people above and usurp themselves authority over other people. Right. So there's, there's another dysfunction because I've never been nobody in my life, so now the anointing make me feel like I'm somebody. And you know what? I believe because we have had, we've come out of a space, particularly in the African-American hue, we've come from the space of nothing. Or at least that's what we've been told. That's it. So let me say this. In Evangelist Michener's day, the church was still in her infancy and developing and becoming. So those who were the like so so her predecessors would have been the industrial age, mm -hmm. right? And then the industrial age gave us the baby boomers. Yeah. So those in the industrial age are now, they are, they are the first generation really post-slavery, right? So I was just, I was just telling some, some guys here at the church the other day, I said that in my family, hear me when I tell y'all this, in my family, on my mama's side, slavery only goes back two generations. My mama, my, my grandfather, mm -hmm. My grandfather, my mama's daddy, mm -hmm. was born in 1897. He was a son of a slave. Mm -hmm. Right? So when that mentality follows the bloodline, I didn't say the behavior. I said the bloodline. Bloodline. the mentality. Bloodline. Okay. When the mentality follows the bloodline, bloodline. what ends up happening is we pass down these dysfunctions because everything is based on what the master said. Y'all see what I'm saying? Yeah, you, was, you was there about, about five conversations ago. Okay, all right. So, so, so what I'm trying to get us to see is, is that we are still functioning as if we've come from nothing when we live in gated communities. Mm -hmm. When we drive at night. Yeah, but the mentality. But it's the mentality. When, when we have 401k plans and mutual funds and IRAs, stuff that our forefathers couldn't even pronounce. pronounce. Mm -hmm. But we have allowed this mentality to be birthed in our bloodlines. I tell my children, you're a saucer. You better carry yourself like one. <laughs> you hear me? You don't come out the house without your hair done. I got all girls. You're a so you got my name on your back. There you, go. you see what I'm saying? I tell, I wish you would come out the house with a with a bonnet on your head. I'll bust you upside your head. I'll bust you upside your head right now. You better not even walk out. You better not walk downstairs with that bonnet on your head. Because, because there is a mentality that goes along with all that kind of thing. Y'all see what I'm saying? And we pass that inferiority complex down our bloodlines. And not telling our children you're royalty. You got you got king's blood running through your veins. Right? And we should be able to tell them where they come from. That in and of itself will really help us to realize, I ain't got to stand for this. I don't have to do this. Um, uh, one of my favorite lines in The Nutty Professor is <laughs> after Eddie Murphy had lost all that weight, he went into the he went into the into the uh, the into the club, uh -huh. and uh, and was it Dave Chappelle? Is that was he the comedian in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it yeah, Dave yeah, Chappelle? Yeah, yeah. And he had the wig on his head, oh, yeah. and, and Eddie Murphy is heckling him from yeah, the. Yeah. And not I don't cuss because I'm saved. Hallelujah. Watch this. But but uh but Dave Chappelle takes that takes that wig off. He said I can't take this no more. <laughs> Right? Because he recognized you heckling me and I don't deserve it. Y'all yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You were trying to damage me publicly and I don't deserve it. And we don't, we don't recognize that 
I ain't got to stand for this. Jesus was the one whipped on the whipping post, not me. Exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, you understand, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, help me out. Talk to me. Some, something that she said earlier about rebuke and where I came from, the script was always overplayed. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Mm-hmm. And me being me, I'm an analyzer, and I know the Bible a little bit. I said, when Jesus rebuked the disciples, it's never in front of people. Mm-hmm. So what you're doing is you're rebuking leaders in front of people, so it make the people that follow them degrade their Spirit. respect for them. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, now it's, wait a minute, I have to, we have to listen to who they listen to because they're not all with the be, but yet we know secrets that we yet still cover. Yeah. Yeah. So open rebuke, they don't mean telling my business to the whole world. That's right. not rebuke. Right. That's embarrassment. Exactly. And you only gonna give too many times to embarrass me. No. Right. And even for when I had left, I knew it because I didn't get a chance to do the letter. I tried to do the letter. I've been to your house before, but you text me everything from email. No, I, I gave my money in your hand. Talk to me face to face, but you keep running. But you know, I could have showed up because I know certain places you're gonna be at. But the Holy Ghost. It's, yeah. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. Come on. I, Isaiah and me really ain't saved. Right, right. So, therefore, you you won't even be a man enough to talk to me face to face. Wow. So it showed me the respect you had, but yet you wait till people congregate and people going in here because they know they hear your voice. They don't hear my side of the story. Right. But my loyalty spoke louder because if he left, something majorly had to be wrong. Mm, that's good. And now it's question: the person who always here is not here no more. Mm-hmm. What happened? Something got to be wrong. So now it's telling the story from your advantage point. Yeah. And people are going to believe because you blessed their life and the word have come to pass and X, Y, and Z. And I'm just a little boy out in the yard somewhere nobody know. You David in the back. Until, and I said that, mm-hmm. when my friend told me what was going on, I said, you my friend, you didn't protect me. So you really didn't love me like you said because you knew the truth and you didn't defend my name. Wow. I said, nevertheless, I said, I do know one thing. David did kill Goliath. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? Goliath had the stage of fooling everybody. He was such a giant. It was a little thing that took him out. Yeah. I said, I'm not going to retaliate, but the Lord knows on the timing when one thing falls and another thing rises. Can I, can I, can I take your, your David scenario even further? Once, once David kills Goliath, the Bible says that he runs up on Goliath, stands on top of him and chops his head off. Here's what you got to understand. God uses your enemy as your platform. Y'all hear this? He uses your enemy as your platform. Isn't it crazy how God allowed David to kill Goliath with Goliath's own sword? You don't have to fight your battle. What you have to do is make sure you have your bag and your rocks and your your slingshot. And when the appointed time comes, because sometimes we fire too quickly. It's not that you shouldn't fire. Sometimes you just fire too quickly. You got to, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They're the sons of God. You got to be led by him. Y'all remember I said to you all in the last episode that the problem that we have in the church is that we don't have enough word in us. We got to have this word in us so that we know how to manage this thing properly. And it will help us to deal with all of those things. Let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you what I believe a, 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 a real leader should do. A real leader should help you recover when you have fallen. I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to help you out with this. The Bible says that Paul is preaching in an upper room. And Paul is what we call an LWP. He a long-winded preacher. (laughs) And the Bible says that there was a young man sitting in a chair by a window by the name of Eutychus. Eutychus falls out the window, breaks his neck, and dies. Watch this. In front of everybody. 
See, you dying in front of people is not the problem. It's the leader that won't restore you. That's the problem. Y'all see this? The Bible says that, that Paul comes down in the midst of him preaching. Come, Peter, sorry, Peter, comes down and lays hands on him and brings him back, goes back upstairs and finishes preaching. Watch this. Never asked for anything to be said about it. He just kept functioning in his role. This is why it's important for you to be around people who are solid in who they are. Because he performed a miracle and never needed to anybody to say, look at what Peter did. Y'all see that? You got to be around people who are healthy. I'm glad you said that, Bishop. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Because if any of us start notice the leaders that we were hurt by. They weren't healthy. They weren't healthy and they didn't have healthy people. Right, They had other cheerleaders that only cheerlead them and nobody really to feed them because exactly. they felt as if they couldn't learn from nobody else. Exactly. That they was the top pinnacle yeah. because of what the doors God had opened that they abused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all of that going back to the fact that because they are hurting, see that? They are hurting and had not adequately dealt with their issues. If you all have any questions, I, I want you all to make sure that uh, you've submitted your questions um, so that we can really talk about them. Are we helping y'all tonight? Are we helping y'all? We helping y'all? I just want to want to say this as the scriptures coming to me. I think it's important to also remember um, that the Bible tells us, I believe it's in Hebrews, it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Yes, sir. Um, but as we're going through pain and going through challenges and going through issues and trying to be free from different things and get healed and get whole, it's important to make sure that we follow the scripture and that we make sure that we put on the right armor of God so that we don't allow things to get worse, if that makes sense. We'll mm -hmm. make sure that we're protecting ourselves in the areas that, that, that God wants us to pr protect ourselves in. And not only that, but you remind me, as he was talking, he reminded me of that scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, that God will vindicate us. Yeah. You know, it's not our, like you just said, it's not our job to fight our battles. Right. God will do that at the appointed time. Right. But we have to trust God that he's going to vindicate me. If he said it in his word, he has to he's not a man that he should what lie ah, neither is yeah. he a man that he had that, that you know he neither repent. is he a man that he should repent but yeah. he will perform what he said in his word so yeah. i have to trust god enough and get the word down on the inside of me enough down in my spirit where it's able to bring forth fruit and believe that god would vindicate me yeah. as i'm still again what you said earlier as i'm still able to respond in the right way yeah. in my attitude yeah all of that kind of stuff matters I want to ask a question back to what you just said. Talk, talk, talk your mic, man. How many people are wounded with armor on? It's possible. Oh, I got a question, though. If they wounded, do they have the armor on? Because I'm thinking, I'm, I'm prior military, Marine Corps, and Navy. Talk to me. There's times you can have cuts and put stuff on because you're so used to keep going back in battle. Yeah. You keep going back in battle because the battle needs to be fought. Yeah. There's not enough time that you take to go, certain wounds, you have to go back to the infirmary. Right, and because if you don't go back to the infirmary and let somebody else work on those wounds, you're no good on the battlefield. Oh, yeah. So you got the yeah. you got armor on, you got the helmet of salvation on. But if your mind ain't right, what good is the helmet of salvation? I'm gonna do you. I'm gonna do you like you did me. Say it again. <laughs> If I have on the helmet of salvation and my mind is not renewed, what good is the helmet of salvation if, if my mind is my mind ain't right? So before I put it on, because we had to put it on daily, that means we had to renew our mind before we start getting dressed. Wow. And I preached a message not too long ago. The men conference is God's not stripping you, He just changing your clothes. Wow. Because you know if a baby make eat, make the mess on themselves, you expose them. You ain't trying to expose them. You just want to get the mess off of them. Wow. And most times people don't lay there enough time, whether it be sheep, whether it be leader, to get somebody else to clean them up before new clothes go on. Yeah. So they got garments and robes and collars, but yet still got mess on them that nobody will clean up. So do that goes so does that goes back to teaching and, and being and being developed and learning? Exactly. And at the same time putting on my armor and at the same time taking a break, taking a rest, going back into the into the chambers to learn again in the classroom to learn yep. again and yep. going back into battle again. But how can I put my armor on if I don't acknowledge what was hurting before I put it on? I want to say this to add to that because <laughs> if we look at armor, do we put put our own armor on because or is somebody else dressing us in armor to go to battle? Oh my God. 
Let's see what the Bible said. <laughs> Let's go there. He, yeah, yeah. Hebrews chapter 11. Because when the king go to, go to battle, he have an armor bearer yeah. who's help, he, help he him dress. Helps, he helps dress him. Mm -hmm. Who's helping certain people dress? Not saying, wait a minute, you have this issue. You have this cut. You have this. But yeah, I'm going to cover it up. But sooner or later, it's going to get infected and it's going to show even with armor on. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's look at it in the scriptures. Ephesians <laughs> chapter 6, verse 10. Listen at, listen at what it says now. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Bible never gave us, the Bible never said that someone else should get us dressed. No. But here's what I do understand that needs to happen. We need to be instructed on how, how to, to get dress. dressed. Because that's not something that we always do enough. Right? right? Um, you get people, and, and it's, it's, said, it's said jokingly or, or to be demeaning. But it does happen a lot of times that you get people, they're saved today and they're an apostle tomorrow. <laughs> At 20 years old. At 20 years old. Let, let me, let me tell you. I had somebody come to me. I hadn't been pastoring long. And I had somebody come to me and say, Doc, you ought to let me make you a bishop. I said, I don't even know what I'm doing yet. It'll, it'll, it'll be January the 13th that I've been pastoring. My wife and I have been pastoring now 13, 12 years, 12 years. I feel a little better at 12 years in than 12 days in. You, you see what I'm saying? We, we don't have to move so fast. Um, when God really has anointed us, that thing will come find us. We don't have to run after it. It'll come find us. And I think we don't, we don't, the, the Bible says, Watch he who have say. a ministry, let him wait on it. Wait on it, wait on it. Let him wait on it. Word say. Right? Because we want to be proven um, in what it is that God is saying to us. So, so, let me, so, so let me give you all this example, right? Because I want to talk to you all about, I want to tell you all some examples um, and explain how like um, projecting hurt on others, especially you know, in the in the in the fact of leadership. So let me let me let me tell y'all about this. Um, if I have a have a need to be publicly affirmed all the time, when I walk in, you got to stand up. Oh my God, let's not go there. Like you Ooh. don't you don't you don't have to do that. I'm a human, right? That's good in some spaces. But the problem with that is that it, it, can, it can become idol worship. That's right? 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 Yeah. There is absolutely nothing wrong with, with your pastor, your bishop walking in, and you say, we thank the Lord for our leader. Thank God. You know, come on, let's give God praise. But, 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 but in, the, in, the, in the light that everything got to stop, right? Because the leader, I ain't God. I just work for him. That's it. Y'all see this? And we turn that kind of thing into idol worship, and then it becomes problematic. And now every time somebody engages with you, they have to engage with you in that space, not because you were worthy of it, but because you had pain that said, you got to deal with me like this. And that, and that in itself can be a very problematic so have you all ever encountered things like that before? Absolutely, I did. You know where I come from. Yes, sir. I do. And people can c come in right now, and people do certain small things. They don't say, no, no, don't. We'll never say, no, you don't have to do all that. Right. And we'll sit there and take their time doing stuff just for the grandeur. And I'm like, and then praise and worship go up, and, you know, most leaders sometimes sit in the back. Right. You sit in the back while praise and worship is going on, and you want to come out and give us a 10-hour message. And expect us to be active all 10 hours, not remember what you said in the first 22 minutes. Or, or the fact that you were not here the first 10 hours. And know what happened before the first 10 hours. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Talk to us. Talk to us. Go ahead. Um, I want to say this the right way. But with some leaders I was up under, it was as if they would bleed on, he or she would bleed on us yeah. and then go tell us to go
go clean yourself off. Go clean my blood off. You damaged me. Now you want me to go and fix me. Yeah, I just believe whether it's going off on a, in, the, in the pool pit because you didn't like something or airing someone's business out because you didn't like how the conversation went or they stood up to you or they left your church. Now take up for me. Accepting their behavior. Yeah, take yeah. up for me. Go vindicate me. Yeah. You better not talk to them. They left my church. Talk about them. Listen, I'm tell I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell y'all this. The Bible is clear. The Bible says that pride goes before a fall. And we cannot operate in these spaces to the degree that people's lives I, I just I just said this. I said this to them um, last week. We were talking last week. And I said to them, I said, we we just had a young lady at our church in um, who transitioned into heaven. She passed in August. That young lady came to us as a broken individual. Um, the Lord gave my wife and I the opportunity to minister to her to the point that she gave her life to Christ. Right. And was living um, a very vibrant and happy life in Jesus. Now, um, this young woman transitioned into eternity and her behavior that got her into her eternity much was based on what my wife and I had to say. You know how big of a responsibility that is? And so for, for us to be in a space, and when I say us, I don't mean my wife and I, I mean men and women of God in the church universal. Mm -hmm. if, if we are functioning with people as if their lives at some point will not transition into, into eternity, and we only take them as being people who are um, managing our agenda at the time, we lose the innocence of ministry we lose the opportunity to be authentic we lose the we lose the, lose the opportunity to be um impactful especially in a in a in a positive way and because people will see ministry as they view us they don't view ministry as they see god they view ministry as they see us and that is the piece that's got to be uh, attended to more than what happens to stroke my ego. That makes sense? Something happened along, I don't know what generation, but a lot of leaders are afraid to show their scars. Yeah. And it's the scars that's, Jesus showed his scars. Yeah. This is proof, you yeah. know, but people are so afraid to... Not your open wounds, not your cuts. The scars mean that you healed, and it lets you know only the Lord could have done this. Yeah, yeah. And you show your scars to the congregation. Vulnerability, no pride. I went through this, you can too. It's different when you just say, don't do this, don't do this. Here's all the, here are the Ten Commandments. I want to know that you feel me. Yeah. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. You, you got to have that. You got to have that. Yes, sir. Talk to me. I have a question. So for me, <clears throat> as we're having this discussion, this conversation, my question is, if we're healed and we're, or if we're getting through what we're getting through and we're, made, and we're made whole, what can we do to go back and help leaders? If we know they may not be healed or whole or we know a certain thing, what can we do in our power? Even though we're not in authority, yeah. what can I do to help that person? I think I think a lot of that has to be um, based on your level of relationship with them. Yes. Um, I've got a spiritual daughter who is a part of this ministry who can call me and say, you missed that. I heard you, but you missed that. And I have to be, I have to be, watch this though. The reason that I can receive that is not just because of my personal level of humility, but because of that person's personal level of accuracy. Y'all see this? 
You can't come to your leader talking out the side of your head and then expect them. Because I'm going to tell you this. My, my wife will tell you this. Um, she, I love that girl. <laughs> but my wife will tell you, you can't talk to my husband with your emotions. You got to talk to him with facts. Because I'm going to tell you this, your emotions come and go. I want to, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? So I'm not concerned as much with your emotions if we can get to the facts. Because if we get to the facts, the facts will inform how you should emote. Y'all ain't hearing me in here. Y'all see what I'm saying? When we manage from that perspective and we're able to talk about things that are factual, because I'm again, I'm not here to take from you what you felt. I just want to help you manage it properly, because if we can manage it properly, now we're not talking every time your feelings got hurt. Now we're saying, OK, I know what you heard, but what do you know? I know what you feel, but what do you know? And we know. Romans 8, 28, all things work together. So if we manage it from that perspective, now we're not, now you are better at being able to manage your own self and you don't need as much counsel because now you're saying, I know what I heard, but I know what truth is. I know how I feel about it, but I know what the truth is. I know he cut me in public, but maybe he was having a bad day. Y'all see what I'm saying? There has to be all of that. And I believe that that we as leaders have as much responsibility to be able to hear from the pew as much as we want them to hear from the pulpit. We got to have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 we had this question come in. The question says, how does church hurt contribute to someone being sat down and how do you come to this decision as a leader? Man, that's huge. Um, that's that's huge. I'm gonna let y'all jump in on that. I, 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 I I'm, I'm, I, I got my own idea about that, but I'm, I'm gonna let y'all jump in on that. Jump in on that. Uh, my grandfather, because I was with him every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I seen him s sit down, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know why though, <laughs> because. Make Farley, you over here causing <laughs> trouble. What the world? I'm saying practically behind the scenes, it's like, okay, just tell him the rehabilitation, teach him. Yeah. You know, you don't know, you can't judge a person off their decision when you don't know the pain or the content behind their decision that they right. made. Right. Right. So when you sit someone down, what made you do that? What was your emotional response? Yeah. Sit down with them and talk, I mean. But I don't, I don't, I'm not a leader per se as an office, but sitting them down that feathers the trauma and the pain. Why am I now I'm not now I'm not worthy? God doesn't love me anymore. I can't be forgiven. So I think it teaches something that's not the Bible. I like you. Cause I'm gonna deal with that. I like you though. Come on, come on. My like answer may not be the most because there, depending on the issue of why I've been sat down, there is a such thing I like to call a detox period. Yep. When I left from where I was at to where I'm at now, I wasn't sat down, but I was sat down. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm coming from a place of hurt, the cliche is hurt people hurt people. Right. Mm -hmm. And I believe like leaving one relationship to another relationship from one thing to another, there should be a detox period where all the old got to be processed out right. while the new is coming and washing it out. Right. Because the leader I have now knew where I came from. We sat down and had a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to preach. I'm not here for all that. I just want to heal. Yeah. And while I'm healing, I'm not trying to secretly go do anything else. I have my spiritual children who I was responsible for. They get that. There was times, still as a prophet, the sort of thing I prophesied. But far as dealing with other people, I'm not dealing with nobody else. It was almost I was nonchalant to people because at any time you might say something and that may get triggered. Right. No matter how much Holy Ghost I have. Right. So the sat down period is 
is a detox period. Why am I am I processing the pain properly? Right. Am I going through managed care? Because when I do, then the season of back to elevation, back to work, now I'm back ready for battle. Yeah. Because through that detox period is now I have all the strength I need because all the wounds are cleaned up, all the sores are healed. All those things that happen. I'm stuck. I'm grabbing the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he might ready to start prophesying. He done grabbed the mic around the top. But, the, but, but the de there, there must be a detox period. So I call it a sit down period, a detox period, because there needs to be a cleansing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Talk to us. Talk to us. Talk to us. Is, is the sit down period so necessary? Saying, so you're saying that it can be a good and it can be a bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Different word. Use another, don't say. Well, sat down, they made it negative because you could, it, they could have made it positive. Right. Yeah. And, but why can't we call it something else? Why does it have to be, you need to sit down, you can't operate right now, versus detox, yeah. heal. Be well, be evaluation because, well, period. Your situation is totally different from what she's talking yeah, cause, about. Cause, because what, totally what she's talking about, because there are some people who, back in the old school church, old school. if a woman oh, yeah. got pregnant, the woman sits down, but the guy still can do whatever. Yep. Play on the piano, play on the piano, organ, everything well, else. Right. The detox, the sat down period is more like a punishment. But punishment. Well, there was never no grace talk, as you said. No. It was just sit down, you don't do nothing. Nothing. But some people needed that because their zeal outran their knowledge. They out there doing whatever they want to do and still want to come in the house of God and do whatever. So, yes, there need to be of, uh, you cannot, you're not going to operate here. You can still learn. Some people need that discipline. I'm, I'm not scared to use the word discipline, but there are That's some good. people who is abused because now your anointing is is a Saul David relationship okay, happening. Okay. The replacement is showing up, and you know it. So as long as I can sit you, put your fire out, you will quit on God, so I can keep being in front of people. Oh, come on, keep talking, keep talking, keep. So, 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 not only do I agree with both of you, I agree with both of you. You do. I do. To. Yeah, I agree with both of them. <laughs> she said, I got to. Um, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't argue what they said. I, I, I'm going to tell you this. I believe, I believe in under the right circumstances, I believe in people being sat down. Mm -hmm. Right circumstances. Under the right circumstances. Right circumstances. And that, that sit down period is the opportunity now not to oust them, no. but to pull them closer. Yes. Right? Yes. So that now I am able to engage with you in a more intimate situation. Watch this. If you go back and you read your, read your Bible, you'll notice that when Eve was beguiled by the serpent, Adam wasn't around. No. She had to have brought the fruit to him. He's going to get it together in a minute. Jesus. <laughs> 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 I've been struggling with mine too. I was just trying. I was just trying to play cool. Um, but but when 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 Eve was beguiled by the by the enemy, Adam was not around. I'm not going to say that every time you were beguiled by issues or problems in the church was that it was because your leader wasn't around. It may have been that you weren't around your leader. That's right. That's right. Because either of the two could be the truth, yeah. right? Either of the two could be the truth. They are. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to begin to see things. I talked about this in the last show. We have to see this thing from a duality, you know, with the duality of vision points, um, that it could be one or it could be the other. And so as long as we are understanding of what that is and how it should be able to function, we will now again be able to engage people properly so that at the moment when we do sit them down, they see it as a, as a time to be able to re-up, yeah. right? As opposed to being a moment where they are being further damaged, right? And again, people should not come. You shouldn't come to a place for free and get damaged. No. no. That's terrible. That's no. true. You ain't got to pay to come here. No. no. You hear me? So you shouldn't voluntarily go somewhere and be damaged. It sh just should not happen. And I think I think the 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 sooner we get to that place, the more healed we can be. Can I tell you this? I'm so excited that we had this opportunity to have this conversation. Did were you all blessed by all of this tonight? Listen, yeah.
I, I want to be able to uh, continue to have these types of conversations with you all. I'm going to tell you all how we can really do that. A, I want you to make sure you have leaned on that share button, right? Make sure that you've gone to our Wise Council podcast page and share this. Um, make sure that you download us on all of your podcast devices. We are everywhere. Excuse me. We are on Apple. We're on Spotify. We're on Google Podcasts. We're on Amazon. We're, we're on uh, iHeartRadio. We are everywhere that you can get your podcast. Um, I believe that what we've heard tonight is going to really be able to help you. Tell you how else you can help us. Um, you, can, you can help to su uh, support us financially if you so choose to do so, right? Um, you, can definitely, you can go to Cash App, and it is Wise Council Podcast. You'll see our podcast um, icon come up there. Um, whatever gift you want to sow, great. If you don't want to, that's cool. Um, we, we're not here for the money. We are, we are here to really help people uh, and see their lives go to the next level. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of Wise Council. We hope that you were inspired, intrigued, and empowered. Do us a favor and be sure to leave us a rating on your favorite podcast outlet of choice. And don't feel shy to leave a critique. Join us again right here for our next episode of Wise Council. Wise Council is a subsidiary of GT Salter and Company.